Hi, everybody. Welcome to the quarantine series, the quarantine film series here. I'm your host, Kapir Segel, and it's great to be back with you, coming to you live from the ATL, Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Thanks for watching, and thanks to all of you for tuning in all around the world. Very excited. And uh, this, you know, this is an effort to put the spotlight on creative individuals, the artists, the filmmakers, the musicians, the authors. These are the people that create the stories that provoke, entertain, and challenge us throughout the year. So if you can, please support the projects. Please check out the projects you discover on this broadcast. And, you know, even, even more, think local. Help the artists in your community, whether it's the local bookshop or the, uh, the local film festival. Um, artists and audiences, we need each other. Symbiotic relationship here. So um, a couple things. First, if you want to uh, learn who will be on the broadcast, you can subscribe to my social media. And you'll be notified. You'll be the first to know or the hundredth to know. It just depends when you check of who will be on the show. And and let us know where you are watching from. We have, um, of course, Atlanta in the house. We have the Bay Area in the house. Very exciting. That's some West Coast uh, love here. And let us know where you're watching from. City, state, country, area code, zip code, provinces. I'm trying to learn the provinces of the world. So drop the pro your provinces in the comment field. Doesn't matter if you're watching live or on the rebroadcast. And of course, if you have a question, if you have a question, feel free to share what's on your mind. I don't have to ask all the questions. I mean, I'm happy to, but let us know and we will try to opine, opine to your questions. So that is the opening spiel. Now for the best part of the show, we get to meet the remarkable artist. And she truly is remarkable, making films at the highest level. She is an Emmy Award nominated director, cinematographer and producer. So she does it all pretty much. Um, her new film, which we'll talk about after an Antarctica, Work in Progress, is a documentary feature following the life of one of National Geographic's most celebrated polar ex explorers. Awesome. And some of her films include 1,000 stories, and her films have been supported by the Sundance Institute and San Francisco Film, SF Film. Um, please welcome to the show, live from San Francisco, the maestro herself, Tasha Van Zandt. Welcome. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. Pleasure to have you. Tell us first, Tasha, how has the quarantine affected you? How's it affected some of your projects that you had in the pipeline? That's a great question. I mean, I think like everyone, it's been a completely pivotal experience. Um, you know, before the shutdown, um, a lot of my work took me on the road so often. So I was constantly traveling and um, working on so many projects in different places. And so um, after the shutdown, you know, I've been here in San Francisco, which has been, um, you know, I've been really privileged to be able to work from home right now um, and to be able to work on a few documentary projects with, uh, you know, COVID guidelines and small crews. Um, but it's been just a completely new world. Um, I think, you know, the biggest lessons I've been taking away in this time in terms of my work is, you know, just this idea of in times when we can't always control change, we can really uh, change our response. So um, that's something I've been really focused on recently is just, you know, how can I change my response to this time? You know, how can I um, evolve my projects to have more impact and um, just really, you know, viewing how I spend my time and what I work on um, in a new way. Wow, that's, that's impressive. I want everyone to hear that. Tasha spending her time in quarantine to go to the next level of consciousness, <laughs> elevated mind uh, and presence. Um, tell me, um, what was meditation part of your routine and how do you um, avoid the Groundhog Day feeling? Is there, is there a daily, daily cup of coffee? What's the routine? Yeah, so um, I definitely meditate. Mindfulness meditation is um, really important to me in my work. You know, when I'm on the road, it, it brings me a lot of um, consistency, but also at home. Um, and then in terms of routine, I'm someone who before this time really didn't have a strict routine because I was traveling so much, you know, I would be um, on the road for months at a time. And then um, when I come home, so much of that was different depending, um, you know, what on what I was working on. Um, and so I've definitely been relearning how to have a routine during this time. Um, you know, recently I've, I've been having a stricter routine. So I, I've been you know, really trying to follow more working hours every day, um, having a lot of meetings in post on a few projects. Um, but um, yeah, you know, I, I think I'm also trying to also 
give myself some flexibility uh, and, you know, take time when I need it, but also have been able to keep busy on a few projects. I'm glad you've been able to, to balance in that, in that way. I do want to talk about some of your uh, projects, one of which, uh, fascinating, it deals with an issue that's will touch so many lives uh, in America, The Gun Chronicles, a documentary film. Tell us about why you wanted to um, cover JR, why you wanted to make a film out of what was an iconic uh, film cover, really. Yeah, so for this project, um, you know, the way that I first started to work with JR was very serendipitous um, and was actually on a previous film called 1000 Stories, um, which followed his San Francisco uh, Chronicles mural. And uh, after that project, we really started collaborating and I started documenting a lot of his work. Um, and so this, I believe this was the next mural project after the Chronicles of San Francisco. Um, and so his team invited me on to come and document the project. Um, and for this project, we traveled all throughout the country um, with JR, um, taking uh, still images and moving video of people on a green screen. And then after they would be documented on that green screen, they would go and have their audio recorded um, uh, where they could share their own stories. And so, you know, what's really remarkable about this piece is, of course, the guns issue in America. There's so many varied perspectives. Um, and he was able to bring so many different perspectives and points of view and voices into one work of art. Um, and then actually after uh, following and documenting the process itself, um, the mural that he created went on and traveled to museums throughout the country. And I was able to travel with that mural as well. Um, and uh, it was displayed in museums and um, different nonprofits and public spaces where people could come for free and listen to all of the stories. Um, and uh, it was really remarkable because during that experience, we were able to see and document so many people from you know, both sides of the map in terms of perspectives on gun control come together and have conversations. Um, so, you know, for me as a documentarian, a lot of the work that I do is I'm looking to create bridges and amplify voices and how we can use our lenses to, you know, really um, create more unity in this world. Um, uh, especially here in America, there's so much divide right now. So finding ways where we can really um, unite people. So this project was so incredible because it really was such a project of uh, unity and um, you know you could really see so many different people uh, shift their perspectives and um, have conversations with people they might not otherwise have conversations with. Yeah it's a very important and important uh, civic contribution I think you made and looking at such a polarizing issue from different perspectives I guess my questions would be how did it did your opinion on the issue become more nuanced as a result of this um, and, and JR did he see what did he think about the cut um, and how he was portrayed in the film. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think for JR, he's coming from France, and so the guns issue, he had such, um, you know, uh, an interesting perspective on it because it's something that they don't see in the same way in France. Um, so he was able to really have, I think, uh, a great, you know, um, observation of it here in the US. And for me, personally, um, you know, I really took a journalistic approach when documenting the project and the piece um, and uh, you know I feel I feel strongly about our need to look at gun control in this country but what it did do is it really helped me um, see where we need to learn to come together and have conversations around this divide because um, you know so many people have perspectives on the opposite end of the spectrum and it's really looking at how can we bring people together to really um, understand where everyone's coming from, but also really create change that's really needed in this country around the issue. Yeah, um, and I wanna ask about, you know, you mentioned 1000 Stories. Um, I do wanna ask, you have such an eclectic uh, background in the, in the projects and films you take on. So what is it, um, what are the types of attributes for the films that you take on? So it's like, oh, I'm gonna turn this into my, my next film and maybe speak about that in context of your previous film that you mentioned, 1000 Stories. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think, you know, where I'm at in my career is I'm still very much building my body of work. But as I look at the links that um, bring it together, a lot of the work ties into unity. And with 1000 Stories, um, that was my first 
project that I did with JR. And um, uh, I think I said this earlier, but it was very serendipitous how it came to be. I um, live in San Francisco and have followed JR's work for many years. Um, and actually back in college, ended up designing my own major, largely inspired by his work in art for social justice. Um, but I was walking down the street one day and saw this large 53 foot truck um, with eyes sweet pasted on the side in JR style and um, approached the truck and out walked um, some of his team members who asked if I was there to participate. Um, so I asked them about the mural and I went in and was actually, I think, the third or fourth participant on the first day of the mural project. Um, so I really experienced it as participants. And when I went into the truck and met JR, um, you know, I told him about my work as a documentarian and that I would love to come back and be able to document the process. And fortunately, I was able to come back the next day and brought my camera um, and really documented it as a one woman band um, because it was such a, a quick turn of events. Um, but that was really a remarkable project to be able to document and observe because it was um, a 30 day project all over the city of San Francisco where they had this 53 foot truck and inside they converted it into a green screen studio. Um, where very similar to his other murals, people could walk in, um, be photographed by JR on the green screen, and then when they left the truck, had their um, audio stories recorded by Ayal, who's a member of JR's team that does all of the audio for these. Um, and it was really incredible because so many people had the same experience as me where they just stumbled upon this and were curious um, and walked into the truck and then uh, you know, JR asked everyone that came inside how they wanted to represent themselves. And so it was really this participatory collaboration. Um, and what else is so great about this project as well in that terms of that theme of unity is that everyone was photographed in the same way. Um, all their stories were shared in the same way. So when you're looking at this piece, um, you know, and you click on the voices, uh, you hear so many different perspectives and lots of life in the city. Um, I believe it was 1,200 people total that are in this mural. Um, and then after the documentation of the mural, it went on to SFMOMA, um, where people could go and experience the LED screen. Um, but what's great is that JR's team also built an app um, through this process. So if you download the JR Murals app, you can actually go and experience this mural and then click on anyone in the piece and hear their story. Very interactive. That's cool. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about documentary filmmaking is sort of kind of you film and then you take you, you strip away peels to get the story. And I'm wondering, and when you film, are you filming with a story arc in mind or are there parts of it where you're just filming and then the story emerges later in the edit? You know, for me, it really depends on the project. Um, I you know, like with these projects with JR, so much of it is about the process. And um, he has uh, this line in, in the video where he says, you know, the process is more important than the final piece to him. Um, and so in the documentation of that, I think I really was inspired by that um, ability to just kind of be mindful within the process. And so I was really focused on capturing as many verite moments as possible and really just immersing myself in that experience. Um, but I knew overall I wanted the structure to really follow that process of what it's like to come upon this truck, go in as a participant, um, have the documentation, and then share your story. Um, but then really bringing in the moments of unity and community that the project sparked around the truck as well. Um, so, you know, I think like projects like this with JR's work, it's so much about collage and like you said, layers, like really building it as it goes. And um, so so that really inspired me in my process of making these films with his team. Um, but then, you know, in some of my other films, there's months of pre-production and research and really looking at, you know, what's the arc of this story and, um, you know, how, how we're gonna build that. Uh, and so I think more, you know, with these, Films with JR, they've been more short form, but with more of my feature work, it's um, a lot more work in the pre production side of things. Right, right. Uh, let's talk about your work in progress film, which sounds uh, pretty amazing, actually. Uh, after Antarctica, 
um, how you're having to balance archival footage with fresh material. Um, how did you come to the story? How did you get involved with this um, with this project? Yeah, so it's actually, um, I grew up in Minnesota, which is where Will, uh, the main subject of the film is from. Uh, and the film is called After Antarctica. And um, it follows uh, polar explorer Will Seeger, uh, who led the longest crossing of Antarctica in history from 1989 to 1990. And it was um, seven months, 4,000 miles, um, with an international team of six people from six countries. And the mission of the expedition at that time was to use it as a way to get the world watching Antarctica so that they could um, reinstate the Antarctic Treaty, uh, which would set aside Antarctica for science only, no exploitation for minerals. Um, and what's remarkable is by the finish line, they were greeted with telegrams from world leaders all over saying how this was the greatest example of international cooperation that they had seen. Um, and actually within the next year, the treaty was reinstated, um, which preserves Antarctica as a place for science. Uh, and so when I, I grew up in Minnesota, and Will Seeger is also from Minnesota, and he was such a hometown hero. Um, when I was growing up, I remember reading through National Geographic and putting pictures of his expeditions up on my walls, um, and just really wanted to one day be able to go on expeditions um, of my own. And uh, over the years, I started working with National Geographic on their expeditions team, leading uh, filmmaking and photography expeditions around the world. And through that, um, ended up being connected with Will uh, and, um, you know, told him about the impact his work had and how I'd love to tell his story. And uh, fortunately, he was on board and it's uh, been years in the making, but we ended up going back to Antarctica together this last year and documenting some of the changes around the Antarctic Peninsula. Because with this story, not only did they do the longest crossing and achieve this incredible feat, but now in the 30 years since their expedition, the three ice shelves the team crossed have disintegrated largely. Um, so it's really the story of not only being the first in history, but now what does it mean to be the last in history? Um, and so really this personal look into the climate crisis through someone who likely has seen more of the polar world than anyone else today. Um, and uh, so with this project right now, we're currently in post-production, um, working with a really great team and uh, you know, we're starting our process of getting ready to submit to festivals. So hopefully can release it soon. Yeah, I like how you put that. You put a real, you almost personified the climate um crisis if you will and going full circle from his first trip to this this most recent trip i do want to ask just in terms of this um project when you deal with a lot of footage this time archival uh, footage how do you actually stay organized and how do you just from a file media management perspective are there like a bunch of spreadsheets are there do you have it in sequences i don't know what you're editing in but how do you stay organized with a project like this yeah, so we were working with a fantastic editor, um, Don Bernier, who edited um, Athlete A, Always in Season, um, so many great films. Uh, so he's been really fantastic. And then we've also been um, working with a great editor, Dana Lamont, um, earlier in our process. And so, you know, as we were filming and also getting archival materials, um, we were really logging and sequencing and organizing as we go. Um, which made a huge difference because there's such a wealth of footage there. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we've been tackling is every night, uh, almost every night on the expedition, Will had an audio recorder where he recorded audio journals across the Transantarctica expedition. Um, so we have, you know, hundreds of hours of these incredible audio journals and logging and going through those and finding moments that we can use to build out the archival part of the film um, has been a huge journey. But, you know, I think really just having gotten started on that in the beginning made a big difference. And um, now where we're at is we're really, you know, working towards that um, rough cut and uh, fortunately have all of our materials logged and sorted. Uh, we have a question here from Van Banerjee. He's asking you, have you filmed Aurora? Australis in Antarctica, did you in fact go there yourself or um, rely on the archival works? That's a great question. So 
When we went back, um, we only uh, went around the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and, you know, Will Seeger's expedition went all the way to Marni um, on the other side of the continent. Uh, and uh, we weren't able to travel through the interior of the continent. Um, but uh, we were able to go back with the National Geographic Explorer ship, um, which was really fantastic. Um, and to see some of the changes more on the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. Got it. Last question for you, uh, just your inspirations as a filmmaker, whether you've admired someone from afar or maybe someone mentored you in, in person. That's that's a great question. I mean, I think for me, I'm so inspired by so many storytellers um, and uh, there's so many films that I love. I think, you know, um, I've learned a lot from the people that I've told stories with. So I've learned so much from Will about the themes of perseverance and, um, you know, continuing to set forth in the face of great loss and, um, you know, just how to use a story to create impact because um, that's what he's really done in his life's work. And then, you know, with someone like JR, I've learned so much by being able to follow his story and process about um, really embracing that process because I think as a storyteller, it's so much about the process. There's so many unknowns and um, so much that we have to adapt to, but by really being able to learn to adapt and be in that process, that's where all the great um, moments are. So um, yeah, I think, you know, really so much from the people I've been able to observe, but um, I have so many filmmakers whose work that I love. And currently, you know, in this time of COVID, um, I've been starting to, I do a lot in documentary, but I'm starting uh, to develop several projects more in screenwriting and um, in the narrative world. And, um, you know, I really love Sean Baker's work, Miranda July, um, Ava DuVernay's fantastic because she's been able to really do both in the nonfiction and fiction space. So, um, yeah, I guess that's a long answer. But no, it's a good answer. Inspired by. It's a good answer. And I can see you're, you're an inspired filmmaker with all the remarkable projects you're making. I do want everyone to check out your website. So let's get that rolling. Learn more. At, there it is on the scroll. TashaBenzan.com, um, and we can learn about your projects, and hopefully we'll be posting about after Antarctica there. So everyone, go bookmark it and follow Tasha online to learn about her wonderful projects coming up. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here. All right, that's our show today. Um, you can um, stay tuned to my social media to learn who we will be featuring, and make sure to take care of the art because the art will always take care of you. Stay safe, everyone, and go vote.